Welcome to Ideation Collective. I'm Jess Larson. Today, we are on part two of our episode with Nina Samosko. My advice would be to go for it. And I think not, you know, I, I think be as innovative as you can and bring forward the proposal. Um, even if it's a long-term business case, bring the business case forward with whatever you've come up with. This is another episode of Innovation and Leadership where we interview all kinds of high achievers from world-class musicians to CEOs, authors, and pro athletes. Try to find the common elements of success no matter what you're working on. Nina is the president of NTT iCubed, which if you didn't get a chance to listen to part one, I really recommend. Um, for those of you who don't know, NTT is a $120 billion company, you know, Fortune 60, uh, Glo Fortune 500 globally. They're number 60, huge company. She runs a pretty amazing place out in uh, Silicon Valley, innovating. Uh, if you missed part one, we were just hearing about uh, putting wearable tech into race car driver suits, which, you know, the five-year-old boy in me loves. <laughs> um, but um, you you had a pretty interesting career be before NTT Cubed, uh, iCubed. Um, tell us a couple of things that you learned from SAP and from Nike. Well, SAP was brilliant in that um, Bill McDermott and the leadership team there has a strong belief in rotating people around the company. I think SAP's uh, goal is to um, cultivate and create leaders who can be CEOs, um, either inside of SAP or outside. And so SAP was an amazing opportunity for me to be in the services organization. I ran a large global P&L for a long time. I was in the alliances group. Um, running the relationships and revenue with our lar the largest system integrators that SAP has. I ended up on the software license side of the house, um, responsible for SAP's uh, top uh, premier network accounts. And um, so it really gave me full visibility and a lot of experience and exposure, which truly, uh, you know, and obviously shapes uh, the leader and the executive that I am today. Yeah. What's an example of something you don't think you would have learned if you hadn't been there? Uh, just so much, yes, so much. Um, first of all, I mean, running it, running a P&L um, where you have quarterly revenue and margin targets and you have to be correct and you have to be right. Um, is certainly something that needs to be experienced and you need to be able to do it successfully. Um, so that, you know, having that experience for a bunch of years, um, because forecasting is sometimes I would say, I'd say all the time, actually, it's an art, not necessarily a science. And um, being able to forecast where you're going to end up um, and do that, do that to the leadership where they can rely on the numbers that you're providing them was a uh, key learning. Yeah. You know, I don't think there's any company out there that wouldn't claim to be innovative and wouldn't claim to be forward thinking. But yep. I mean, I'm thinking of another space. You look at what SAP did in content marketing. I mean, they, they saw that wave way before other people and they got out there with yeah. more than just cramming ads down your throat. I mean, they were legitimately... A, a serious leader in something that, you know, the rest of the world's been playing catch up on. Yeah. Well, but, and that be, yeah, SAP was brilliant actually at leveraging an ecosystem, right? I mean, Hasso Plattner and his relationship with Stanford university, the fact that um, the heart and soul of SAP's engineering um, is in Germany, culturally mm -hmm. completely different um, than the SAP labs and all of the colleagues that are, developing um, here uh, at their Palo Alto location. Um, so SAP has done a brilliant job of um, making smart acquisitions like Hybris um, and leveraging their ecosystem. I think they, they, they did that better than anybody else. Yeah. Um, and you were saying before the show that you feel like Nike was a unique experience, taught you some things that you like and some things that you don't want to do and, and helped you get where you're at today. <laughs> well, 
Yeah, I mean, I feel, I mean, I went to, to Nike, number one, because the, um, all the core values of Nike I believe in. I work out a lot. Um, I probably have a little bit of an issue because I work out maybe too much. I, I train really hard. Um, and it was important for me from a business standpoint to get the other side of the coin. I had been at, um, you know, Tandem Computers, which got purchased by Compaq HP. I had been at Siebel Systems, Oracle, SAP, all kind of on the enterprise side of selling software and hardware into large enterprises like Nike. It was really important for me to take a step back, invest in myself, and put myself 180 degrees away from that. And uh, wow, it is way more difficult to be inside a large enterprise like Nike and, and having to absorb and handle all of the enterprise software that it takes um, for a company like Nike to run. Very difficult, amazing learning experience. Um, I remember I called Bill McDermott and Rob Enslin after I had been at Nike for about a year. And I said, hey, both of you, what you should do is every sales leader with an SAP, you should mandate that they take like a six month sabbatical and go into uh, one of our, you know, one of the SAP customers and experience it because uh, it's just, it was eye opening and um, amazing opportunity. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to talk about kind of some of the, the mindsets that maybe hold people back. Um, and this is something you and I were talking about just for a minute before we got going today, but you know, our consulting firm, Mylan Advisors, we have a lot of, of government clients and some military clients and, um, and even just some of our, our larger entities, there can be a bit of a feeling of innovation comes out of startups of, well, the hurdles are just too high to do anything cool around here. The, the red tape is too thick. Um, yes. Can you talk about how you guys are beating that game? Yeah, well, I mean, I think NTT uh, is amazing in the fact that they set up a completely separate legal entity um, that is NTT iCubed, and they have an outsider like myself running it. Many of the innovation centers here in Silicon Valley um, have, you know, long-term execs of whatever firm that is running the innovation institutes. Sometimes they are uh, not separate. In fact, most of the time they're they're still a part of the mothership. Um, and I think that makes things very difficult. Um, being part and you know you know <laughs> you're part of the the business. You have the PL and margin targets that you can't get away from. It's really difficult to be as innovative, free, and open when you are inside a large enterprise, you know, that has requirements to the street every quarter. So I think NTT, um, you know, has done an amazing thing with setting up NTT I cubed as they, as they have done. I think it's not common. Yeah. If you had to advise someone who maybe it isn't their choice, whether or not they can carve off, you know, they have to, They've been given some leeway to innovate, but they haven't been given the kind of freedom you've been given. What kind of advice would you have for someone to at least do the best they can within that constraint of they don't get to have a legal entity and they, they've got the staff they've got? What kind of things could they do in their favor? Great question. My advice would be to go for it. And I think not, you know, I, I think... Be as innovative as you can and bring forward the proposal. Um, even if it's a long-term business case, bring the business case forward with whatever you've come up with. Um, so I would encourage the team members to be open, um, even if it is leveraging or harnessing a competitive technology from where you are, even if you think, oh my gosh, our, you know, my executives will never go for this. This is so outside the realm and it costs this much money and they'll never do it. Don't be afraid to propose it anyway. Put the business case together. Um, try to make it as simple and straightforward as possible, which takes way more time to do that than it takes to, you know, 
have something long winded and 50 slides long. <laughs> um, but I would encourage everyone to just go for it. You have to. It's interesting. Um, you know, that quote that's attributed to Leonardo da Vinci about simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Oh, it's so much harder to be simple. Yes. This was a this was a lesson I took away from Siebel Systems. You know, Tom yeah. Siebel used to say we used to have an expression at Siebel called "crayon it out," which basically meant if you could explain it to a you know six or seven year old, you were on point. And if you couldn't, it wasn't simple enough. So go back to the drawing board. And uh, I think about that a lot. You know, um, I I was lucky enough to go take some classes at Stanford that Hasso Plattner um you know the D school there right with all yep. the IDO yep, the stuff design. and yep. Yep. design thinking mm -hmm. stuff and I feel like that's really something they they're a proponent of also when you think about us as leaders or, or anybody listening who's a leader who they want more innovation and they want their people to think it through to the level that it's been crayoned out, which I think is a great saying. I totally hope to plagiarize. <laughs> we have um, to credit Tom Siebel for that one. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. We will all be plagiarizing you now. Um, <laughs> when you think about a mechanism or systemizing a requirement for something to be crayoned out, I mean, it doesn't seem like it would be that hard to invent the system, but it does seem like it would take some discipline to require people to not just give you the complicated version. How could you, how could you systematically encourage people crayoning it out? Okay. Would be, uh, wow. Because, you know, everyone thinks differently. And so what it would take for me to simplify something, especially, you know, here at NTT IQ, where we're so culturally diverse, right? The, the Japanese way of thinking and of innovating is completely different than the Germans or the Polish or the American way. So your question um, is, uh, wow, it, it would be great to have a system, but I'm not sure that system would cut across all the cultural diversity that we even have here, as an example. Um, it is you know, it is pushing, it is looking at a proposal as leaders and then pushing your people back to make it simpler. Can you say what you're saying in these 20 slides in 10? Once they get it to 10, okay, can you get it to five? And then I, I tell my folks all the time who have children, literally, please sit down with your 12 year old. And if they can understand this, you're on point. I, I, I have them test it with, you know, people who are not in high tech, who are people who are not in innovation, test it. Yeah. No, I think about, you know, the theory of constraints and how sometimes it can spur people on to better versions of themselves. Yeah. You know, like there's the famous Dr. Seuss story about he wrote the one book and it only had however many words in it. And so his editor said, I dare you to write a book that only has, you know, 50 words. And he came out with <laughs> green eggs and ham yes. that sells better than everything else. Right. Going back to kids exactly. here. But, but yep. I think, I think you answered my question right there, you know, like even, you know, being flexible and, and taking the different cultural backgrounds, but still like maybe just choosing not to choosing not to take the first version and, you know, making things go through at least three iterations of, of pushing people to simplify. And, and, um, I love your idea of, you know, have a check mark. Have you explained this to someone who do, who has no idea what you're talking about? Oh, <laughs> you know, yeah. is there a 12 year old? I is there people, a 12 year old you can yeah. try this out on? That's right. I make people run it by their wives, their parents, right? Who are of a different generation, and um, it's so interesting what what comes back. But it, there's and so it's much. Hard. It takes a village. Well, there's so much you take for granted explaining it to your coworkers, right? Exactly. All the all the high tech acronyms, right? Yeah. Okay. I love this crayon it out. We probably have w time for one more principle to steal from you. Can you give us another good one? Oh my gosh. I can't. Um, yeah. Give me something. Jess. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Here, here's some, here's something else. Um, you, I guarantee you have some pretty cool people working for you. What's something that you have learned being at this place, having these engineers, seeing this done, 
what's what's a way that it's influenced you? What's something you've learned from this organization you you're running now? Wow, I, I learned from I learned from this team every single day. I never thought the words elliptic curve cryptology would ever even be in my vocab, Jess. Right. So, <laughs> um, some of the things I've learned is. Or just pick one. Um, just pick one that you feel like really. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't is, believe this guy pulled this off. Yeah, breaking rules. Okay, breaking rules and still um, being successful within the corporate, uh, a conservative corporate confine. So having the balance to break enough rules to get what you need done, done, um, and be successful within a large organization like NTT Group. Um, I, I, it's, you know, one of my guys and who's responsible for a very large, uh, product that we just went to market with, it blows my mind what he has done. What, what sector? Just, yeah. I mean, you don't have to tell us top secret it, it, stuff, it, but it, it, yeah, it's software defined networking. Okay. Um, it's a software defined, uh, networking product, uh, called cloud WAN, okay. uh, cloud and then W A N we've just launched it in Africa and in Japan. Um, and this Japanese engineer is absolutely brilliant and has just job uh, in. And how did he break the rule? Uh, well, he leveraged a large ecosystem of folks outside of NTT Group, inside of NTT Group, cross companies within NTT. He just did what he needed to do externally and internally to build this product, which is highly competitive and effective in today's market. Um, and I'm super excited to see the success that we're having right now, but more proud of him for just, just again, not asking, just doing. Yeah. Is it more of a, we'll ask permission, we'll ask for forgiveness instead of permission kind of thing, or how would you describe yeah. it? Yes. Yes, exactly. I, I think that's, I think, yeah, I would say yes. So how do you, how do you help a team get a sense for, you know, the proper amount of rule breaking? I mean, obviously nothing illegal, yeah. obviously, you know, like, right. <laughs> no, there, exactly there's, there are right. still limits, but how do you give them there a are. sense? How do you give them a sense for an appropriate amount of rule breaking? Yes, that is a, a difficult one, but I think, I think you have to leverage your personal relationships you have to both, again, inside the company and out um, to get to the desired outcome. And so this goes back to what we were talking about in part one, just about, you know, you, you have many ways to get from point A to point B mm -hmm. and allowing people freedom within a framework mm -hmm. to achieve it. Right. So freedom within a framework. So I, we try to provide a framework. But I also want to allow a lot of freedom within that framework for people to get done what they need to get done. You know, but I liked your point about personal relationships. And maybe this isn't where you were going with it. But I could see, you know, if people see that other people did that and they didn't get their hand slapped, um, going to the personal relationships you have in the company and saying, hey, listen, I want to do this thing that I know is kind of against the rules. <laughs> What's your, but I think it's an okay amount outside of the rules. What do you think? And just having like a little bit of a sounding board, even if it's not official, like don't go ask your boss, you know, but go absolutely. ask those personal relationships. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's exactly what I encourage people to do. Cause if they say, no, that's do illegal. That. Don't do that. You know, pull it back. Well, right. I mean, we're, not, we're definitely not breaking any laws. I know, of, I know. Course. of course, but um, to do things that are outside of the box. Um, you know, this person leveraged other software companies. He leveraged other system integrators, um, you know, outside of NTT group, um, as well as heavily leveraging the NTT group ecosystem inside. Um, so just, you know, it was a multi-year brilliant result, but many times, like, you know, we didn't find out what was really happening till it was done. And kudos to him for taking the risks and it, it's paid off. You know, it's interesting how taking the kind, you know, taking survivable risks, right, is so yes. required while avoiding risk is. is so unhelpful to innovation, right? You got that right. Yes. Well, listen, we really appreciate the time you spent with us. What's um, to close off here? What's the best piece of advice you ever got, or what's just 
one more thing that you would want to encourage people that's either been helpful to you or something like that? Hey, I'm going with the Nike mantra of just do it. <laughs> I love <laughs> that it. That is the piece of advice that I would give to everyone. If you think about it um, and you want to do it, do it. Love it. Okay. You heard it here first, folks. Go do it. Nina, thanks so much for making time <laughs> awesome. for us. Hey, it's been fun. Thank you. Well, that's it for the episode. One other thing I wanted to tell you about, if you remember the guys from Convoy uh, in episodes back, Ken Free and Trent Mano, I went on one of their CEO trips to New York and I met a guy named Brent Thompson, very successful entrepreneur. He was former CEO of Jive Communications, big uh, company now, I think three or $400 million. Anyways, he, uh, he started a new company called blipbillboards.com. I'm super stoked they're a sponsor now. But I, I remember a year and some ago when I met him, I thought it was genius. Instead of having to buy six months or a year's worth of billboard uh, for thousands of dollars, you can buy eight seconds at a time for like 10 or 20 cents. You pick what billboard you want it on, what time of day you want it to run, and it just puts so much power in the hands of, of marketers and CEOs who want to try something and see if it works. You can buy as many or as few as you want, change it as many times as you want. Uh, I think now our podcast is being advertised on billboards in like 18 different states because we have these guys as sponsors. We're pretty excited about it. Hope you check out blipbillboards.com. Thanks.